Hello, you're watching a lesson on managing vApps. In this lesson, we'll be primarily focusing on the vCloud Director cells, or specifically the vCloud Director configuration. Now for this, we'll be logging in as a handful of different users to give you the perspective of what the lifecycle of a vApp looks like from a systems admin, an org admin, as well as a consumer within an organization. Now the work that we do in this lesson will directly impact the vSphere resource cluster because that's where the vApps, the templates, the media, and etc. live. So none of the things that we import or work with from a vApp perspective live in the management cluster. It's all controlled from the vCloud director cell and ultimately ends up in the resource cluster. To begin with, let's go pretty deep onto catalogs. Now, a catalog lives within an organization, and the primary object that lives inside of a catalog is a vApp template. You can kind of think of a vApp template as the building blocks that is used to consume your vCloud. A vApp template could be one virtual machine or many virtual machines. So you can have a vApp that literally has just one virtual machine inside of it. You're never going to see just a virtual machine in your catalog. It'll be encompassed within a vApp. So Everything, no matter how many virtual machines it has, is a vApp. In order to build vApp templates, you need to populate your catalog. And this can be done by uploading OVF packages or importing directly from vSphere. Now, OVF is a great way to take someone else's product, maybe they've built a vApp for you, and import it into your cloud. Or even you've built one in your environment, maybe in your vSphere environment, you've packaged it up using this OVF, which is the Open Virtualization Format package, and you're putting it into your cloud. So it's a good way to transfer from one cloud to another, or to get things into the cloud initially, and then you can work on them further from there. Importing directly from vSphere is a good migration path. It's a way that you can take existing virtual machines or workloads and import them directly from vSphere into your vCloud environment. I will comment and make sure that we point out that catalogs can be published to other organizations. So depending on what type of catalog it is, whether or not it's private to your organization or public to all organizations, you want to be considerate as to what vApps you put into the catalog because those templates could potentially be used by other organizations. Additionally, don't forget that you can set sharing controls on the catalog. Now there's a vApp author role which kind of has all-encompassing power over the catalog but you could also share out specific catalogs to different groups so that they can use only what you want them to use. There's also different media types that you can upload into the catalog. You're not specifically bound to just having fully baked vApp templates in there. You can provide media so that people can kind of build their own vApps on the fly. It can also be used for different software installations so that you can provide, let's say, Microsoft Exchange DVD by means of an ISO or something else like that. And that way, someone else could take a virtual machine that you may have Windows installed on, they can insert that Exchange DVD uh, virtually, and then install the application so they can kind of customize their own virtual machines. So the three main media types that you can import are Open Virtualization Format, which again, kind of covers the vApp perspective, but you can also provide it as a media so that people can build their own vApps and include an OVF inside of the vApp. Think of it as, I'm going to build maybe two virtual machines that are custom within my, my vApp, and then lay in an OVF on top of that. The other one is an ISO, and that's just a CD or a DVD image, nothing that you're probably not familiar with already, but you can provide those to other people so they can install applications or services. And the final one, uh, and you might snicker thinking floppy, FLP files, why would you ever need those? Well, one really good example that I see commonly is if you want to use paravirtual SCSI drivers. And that's where you're basically providing a pass-through where there's really no emulation of hardware for the virtual machine as far as its SCSI controller goes. In order to do that, you have to provide the drivers, especially for Windows. It just won't even let you install on a paravirtual SCSI adapter without having the drivers ready to go. So you can provide a floppy image for your users in case they want to do something like that, 
or maybe you have some legacy software that just relies on a floppy disk. So the options there, I don't see it consume too much beyond that pair of virtual example, but you can use it if necessary. So let's dive into the lab. I'll open up Internet Explorer. We'll log in as the systems administrator, and we'll go over basically importing vApps and these media types. Okay, so here I am at the login screen for the vCloud director, and I'll type in my administrator credentials. There we go. Now in previous lessons, I went ahead and built a organization called Public Catalog, and its sole job in life is to provide vApp templates and media to other organizations. So we'll start there. I'll click on Manage and Monitor. I've already got organizations selected, so now I'll choose Public Catalog. And it opens a new tab because I'm now controlling uh, objects within the public catalog organization. I can do this because I'm the systems administrator and I have authority over everything within vCloud. As an alternative, I could log on as someone who has power over just the organization and do it that way. So I'll start by doing it as a systems admin and then we'll switch over to an org admin so you can see the differences. So to begin with, I'm going to go to catalogs and then you'll see there's two options because this is kind of a special organization that has public catalogs. A public catalog is just a fancy way of saying I've made a catalog that other organizations can see. And if you look really closely, there's a little globe in front of that catalog, meaning that it's been published. Now if you'll notice, my organization catalogs includes private and public catalogs. I name them that because it's simple. One is public and it's denoted by this little published globe right here that says published. The other one is private and you can see it's got a dash there saying it's local. So the only person or people that can see the private catalog is this organization. Whereas the public catalog, everybody can potentially see that one. Now if I wanted to change this, I could click on the catalog and go to the little widget gear right here, and I could change the publish settings. So I could change this to be a private catalog, which basically means don't publish, or I can continue to publish it to all the organizations. It's really that simple, and the only thing that changes is the visibility of the catalog. Now you'll notice here, because I own these two catalogs, I can see private and public. If I go to the public catalog section, the private one disappears because now I'm looking at catalogs that are published publicly. And the only one that is, is the public catalog, which I happen to own. That's why it says organization public catalog. Now within the catalog, it's pretty much empty right now. There's no templates or anything like that. So let's provide some stuff into the catalog. Now, if I'm in this public catalog section here, I really can't do much. There's only uh, a way to import into my cloud, but there's nothing in here, so that option is grayed out. And there's a gear here with no selections. So you might think, oops, is it broken? Is it not working? No, it's just because I'm in the public catalog section, I really can't do anything to a catalog. I need to go back to my catalogs. Then I can click on the public one, and it opens as a recent item here. And now I have a ton of options available to me. So really the main ones are, this one here uploads a file into the templates section. So that could be the OVF file. And this one imports from vSphere. Those are the two main ways you get things into your catalog as far as a vApp template is, is concerned. Now once something is in the catalog, I can further use this option, add to my cloud, and that'll take the template and suck in an, a vApp into my cloud. But we don't want to run any kind of workloads in the public catalog organization so we're not going to use that for public catalog. And then there's a way here you can see the progress of any uploads and downloads that are occurring to your catalog. And this is just a way that you control it with the actions here. So by default, it just kind of gives you a repeat of what you see in the menu, things that you can do. So let's go ahead and import an OVF so that we can build a vApp template. I just click the button for upload, and then I need to find an OVF package. So we'll browse. And amazingly enough, I already have one in here. I've got one called the vSphere Management Assistant because it's pretty small and it's a good example. It's just a little OVF file that VMware provides. And my clicking skills are very poor right now. There we go. So there's the file OVF. And notice here, it kind of reinforces those three types I was talking about. OVF, ISO, and floppy or FLP. You can't really change to anything else other than that. So we'll upload this file. If you give it a second, it'll build the path to where it's at. Now we need to give it a name. 
This is the name someone's going to see the vApp template as in the catalog. So it should be relatively descriptive, and you can use spaces. So I might use VMA version 5. It goes red if you leave a trailing space. That's not allowed. So just make sure you have spaces within it. That's, for, that's OK, but no trailing spaces. And I could say VMA version 5 for your cloud, you know, something happy and exciting. For this one, it's kind of obvious by the name what it is. But maybe if I only had VMA in the name, I might say VMA version 5 down here. Now, when we're importing it, in this case, it's the public catalog. So there's really no other destinations. There's only one virtual data center. And it's one I made called the Public Catalog Organizational Virtual Data Center. And it says right here in the description that it's used for holding public catalog templates. So there's really no that choice. But if you had an organization that was importing something into its catalog and it had multiple virtual data centers, you may want to choose one with slower disk or one with more capacity or something that matches the needs for this catalog. And again, I only have one tier of disk provided to this organizational virtual data center. It's the tier one disk running on SATA. But if I had multiple tiers of disk, maybe SATA or SAS or even Flash, I probably wouldn't want to put a catalog item on Flash. That's kind of a waste of capacity. I typically want to put it on the slower, higher capacity disk because it's not really doing anything. The only time I need it is when I'm deploying from it. And then I've already got it set to the public catalog, so there's no other choice. We'll upload that. And this is the little up and down arrow thing that I showed you uh, the icon for earlier. Now, because I'm using untrusted certificates, I'm getting some little warnings popping up. It's basically saying the certificate I have is this information. It's uh, from the vCloud director server uh, and that the information we filled out very early in the course and that it's a valid certificate, but it's not trusted. So for every file it's trying to upload, one of these are going to pop up and I believe this is three files. So we're going to say yes to these exceptions. And I think a third one may pop up. That's normal if you're using untrusted certificates. There's the third one. And you can click yes on those as long as you trust that certificate uh, because it was self-signed when it was created. So we'll let this do an upload, and I'll be right back. OK, the upload was successful. But this is kind of the first half of the transfer progress. It's not actually in the cloud yet. We've just given it to a staging area. So I'm going to click clear because I don't want to see this the next time I open up the transfer window. Don't worry, it doesn't delete the VM or anything like that. It just clears the, the progress window. We'll close that window. And then now you see it's in the next step of actually importing it into the cloud environment. So if I click on importing, you can see that it's just running a job that's importing the OVF file into a VApp template. Nothing special there, but I wanted to show you uh, that you can click on it and get details on it. We'll click OK. We'll let that import. While that's importing, Let's go on to kind of the second way that you can import uh, vApps, vApp templates into your catalog. But I'm going to log out and not be the sysadmin, and we'll just log in as just a, uh, an org admin. So I'll click log out here because within Internet Explorer, you can't be logged in twice. Uh, you can only have one session active at a time. Now, this is a common pitfall. You might try to log in as the other user, uh, which in my case is Bob Sponge. He's the org admin for... The, pub, uh, the public catalog organization. So I'm going to try that really quick. I'll click login. And it's going to give an authentication error. And we'll ignore this whole pop up here. And why is that? Well, really, you're trying to log into the system organization, so to speak, the, the root system account, uh, using an org account. And that's just not going to fly. Uh, the, the way you can fix that is just by trying to log into the correct organization. So by here, you can see the path is just cloud with nothing after it. I've logged in a couple times with different catalog or with different organizations, so you can see them here. I want to log into the organization called Public Catalog. So I want to go here uh, using slash org slash public catalog. Alternatively, I made shortcuts for all of them, and I advise you do the same in case you need to log in to different organizations. So I have a shortcut right here that I'll use. As you can see by the link, it goes to cloud slash org slash public catalog. I'll click on that. And there we go. We're now ready to log into the public catalog organization. And it doesn't really tell you that you're trying to log into that. It just looks like the same kind of generic login screen. But it's just something to know and be aware of. Otherwise, you might think, man, did I mess up the password? Or is the account blocked out or what? And in this case, I was, uh, 
uh, a little tried to save some time, so I went ahead and had it save the password for me. So now that Bob Sponge is logging into his organization, he's now recognized as an organization administrator. But you'll notice all the other kind of options are gone. I can't go in a system. I'm permanently stuck in public catalog because that's all the authority I have is just public catalog. So if we go into catalogs here from this perspective, it kind of looks the same. We can see the organization catalogs and the public catalogs. And if I go into this public catalog here, we'll see that the VMA was imported. It's now ready for use, and someone else can grab that and use it. One thing I will note is this gold master thing. And this kind of confuses people because what's a gold master? Typically, gold master denotes that the VApp template is kind of in its final state. It's something that you don't want people modifying. They can use it and they can further uh, make a copy of it and modify the copy, but they really shouldn't modify the source VApp template. Other than that, it really doesn't do anything. If I go to the action wheel here and go to properties, gold master is just no or yes, and it's really a symbolic change. Nothing actually happens to the VApp template. It doesn't lock it or do anything crazy like that. I'll go ahead and denote it as a gold master because I don't want anyone messing with this particular VApp template. I'll click OK on that. And it's just going to put a little gold CD there to show you that you know this is kind of the master copy. No one should be playing with it. So I promised you that we would do an import uh, from vSphere. So let's do that next. So we'll go back to the app templates here. And you'll notice, oh, wait, where did it go? I don't have access to that. I'm just an org admin. So the little icon that would let you import is gone. So this is where I wanted to show you there is kind of a little hokey pokey about who can do what, who can import from vSphere, who can't. An org admin doesn't have any visibility into vSphere. It doesn't know, it's not an account that has access beyond its organization. So I actually can't do it as an org admin. I can upload my files, or I can take things that are in here and add them to my cloud. You see that highlight, once I highlight a template, I can add it to my cloud as a vApp, but I can't actually pull things in from the vSphere environment into the cloud environment. That would be kind of a security hole, wouldn't it? Because then someone could potentially see things in vSphere. So we'll do the shuffle again. I'll log back out. And again, I've got shortcuts to everything, so I'm going to go to my favorites, go back to the system, which is just the vcd.glacier.local slash cloud. And I'm going to log back in as a systems admin who has full visibility to everything. So let's log in as the administrator account. We'll go back to managing and monitoring the environment and the public catalog. I'm going to click on that. Go back to catalogs. And there we go, here's the public catalog right here. And now the option's back. I can now import from vSphere again. So it, just remember, anyone in an organization really can't see anything in the vSphere level. We are partitioning that off of them. So I can click the import button. And just for kind of showing you, I went ahead and threw a virtual machine in here. It's not really doing anything, it's just called old VM. But pretend this is the legacy virtual machine or the vSphere virtual machine that you wanted to pull into your cloud environment. It's very simple. You select the vCenter that you're wanting to pull from. It could be the one that we're working with now, or potentially you could tie vCloud to a different vCenter. In this case, we have one choice. It makes that kind of easy. Uh, I would select the old VM, and I could give it a name. So I could pull it in as old VM2, or even just with the same, na same name. doesn't really matter. And give it a description. This could be the legacy database application and again, there's no real choices because it's the public catalog. We only have one organizational virtual data center and one storage profile. Now, the real choices here are copy or move and gold master. So copy or move can be important. If you move a virtual machine that really shouldn't be moved, you know, people are working on it or using it, that can be bad. A lot of times I just default to copy because if something messes up, or if later I decide that, oops, I didn't want to move that, it's nice to just have the other one on the vSphere side, and then I just delete it from vSphere later when I know I don't want it. So I almost always default to copy. And the gold master, again, that's, that's very arbitrary. It really depends on what you're moving over. We'll go ahead and flag that one yes, just for fun, and click OK. So it's going to go through the same process. It's going to import that virtual machine and put it into the catalog as a vApp template. And there you go. It's copying it, so it's not removing the old one. So the end result is you'll now have old VM and VMA 
as vApp templates in your public catalog. These are things that you're offering to other organizations to consume. Now, necessarily, do you want to use old VM and VMA? It really depends on your environment, but for, you know, basically for our developers, this is exactly what they need and we're providing it for them. All right, so the next thing I want to show you was media, and that one's pretty straightforward. If I click on media, I've already got an ISO that I put in there, and I'll show you how I did it, but it, it's a, a very, very straightforward process. I click on the upload, and we can find the media file to upload. In this case, I'm going to do an ISO. So I had this RHEL server boot ISO here. Uh, RHEL is Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We can upload that. I can call it uh, RHEL boot ISO version 6.2, something descriptive. Because that's already pretty descriptive, I don't need a, a fancy description here. I might just copy it and have it in there again. Again, the catalog, the public catalog organization doesn't have any choices here. We only have kind of one place to stick this stuff. So we'll upload that and you get the fancy little transfer progress and the certificates that aren't trusted. You'll get very used to that unless you have signed certificates that you trust. And it'll upload that. Let's click yes on that. Now what I do want to show you is you might be wondering, okay, with a vApp template, that's obviously going to build a virtual machine somewhere in the cloud, but where does an ISO file go? I mean, there, you can't represent that with a VM file. So let's look at the vCloud side and kind of see what it's doing. So I'm going to clear this upload, and we'll close that. And you can see it's now importing into the system. Uh, one was done by Bob Sponge. One was done by me. So let me switch over really quick to the private cloud infrastructure that we have for Chicago, and we'll see where these objects go. OK, so now we're in the vSphere client for the private cloud. This is specifically the resource cluster. And I've expanded a couple different resource pools so you can see what it's doing on the back end. So here's the public cloud, the public catalog organizational virtual data center, and here's those two templates that we imported, the old VM and the VMA. It's still actually pushing over the old VM. It's doing a clone right now. And that's why VMA has this fancy little graphic with uh, the three little colored squares, and old VM doesn't. Because old VM isn't all the way imported yet. And here's the original file that I had in a resource pool called old VMs. So this would be like a virtual machine that's still being used as a kind of a server, a standalone server. And then this copy, which has the long GUID file here, will be the one used by the catalog. Now, I told you that we wanted to really figure out where it's putting these ISO files. Where is it putting the media files at? Because, again, a VM is easy to see. It's right here. If I go to the data stores right here, and I look at the data store that the catalog is using, which is this Tier 1 SATA disk one, I can then... Uh, browse the data store right here, and we'll search that path. Okay, so you can see a list of all the different folders that are in here, and the DVS data is used for the distributed switch, and there's some other stuff in here, but really what we're looking at is the name of our cloud, Chicago Cloud. So there we go. Within Chicago Cloud, you see a folder called Media. That's actually under the covers where it's sticking all the media files. So it's going in the data store that the public catalog organization has available to it, and it's just putting it into a special folder path uh, called media. So now that you know how to import vApp templates and build media files and really work with catalogs, let's move on into the lesson and start talking about vApps. All right, so let's go over building a vApp. When you want to build or deploy a vApp, there's really three ways you can do it. The first is just add a vApp from the catalog, and that's really kind of the main intent of vCloud, is that you have this kind of catalog, or service catalog, so to speak, of different workloads that someone can pick and use that to build upon. You're not really building unique use cases here. You're building a catalog of stuff that can be used over and over and over again. So when you want to add a vApp from the catalog, the consumer of the cloud or even you uh, goes into the catalog and, and kind of picks something that was pre-built and a great use case for this that I, I kind of outlined is a stack vApp where maybe you have uh, you offer a database virtual machine and a web server virtual machine and an application server virtual machine a common use case might be something like SharePoint uh, where you're providing the baseline vApps and then they can go and build a kind of a, a large vApp out of these different offerings from your catalog. 
So that's a really great way to do it. Uh, that use case is not always going to be ideal. You can't always just create everything that they want up front. So the next option is they can build a new V app based on your templates. So they can take multiple templates or even just one template and kind of take that as a starting point and add their own flavor to it. So in this case, one, one good example, we'll go back to that stack V app is instead of taking your stack, maybe you're not providing a database web server and application server as one template. They may be three different templates and each template just has one of those pieces. They could build a new V app and import all those three different templates into that V app along with maybe making their own new virtual machines. They don't have to necessarily use something from the catalog. They don't have to use a template. And that's where providing media can help is you can say you can use my Windows server for your database or you can build your own, you know, whatever you want to give them control over. There's also times where you'd say, no, you're not getting media. You're going to use my database and, you know, stamp your feet and, and pound your fist and say, this is the database that we use, and that's the one you're going to use. Because it may be the, the manager over the development team or, or the application team has said, this is a blessed version of the database. It has all our security patches on it, and it has all of our control points on it. I don't want you rolling your own or building your own. The difference between the two really is that the admin that built the, the vApp template has less control when someone is building a new vApp based on those resources. But that isn't always a negative. That could be the intent. You could say, I'm going to provide you templates for databases and web servers and, and what have you, and you can combine them in every any combination you want. Think of it like when you buy Legos. They don't come pre-assembled. Here's all the blocks. You turn it into a spaceship or a pine tree or whatever it is you want to build. Now, the third option I kind of flag as a, you know, not necessarily what we want to do because it's the import from vSphere method. So as you can probably guess, based on past conversation, the only person that can do this is the system's admin. No one in an organization has the ability to import from vSphere. And it's kind of skipping the template step. In this import to vSphere method, you're taking a VM from vSphere and directly turning it into a vApp. It's not hitting a template anywhere. So it's, it is an easy migration path, again, from vSphere to vCloud, if you don't need a template for that option, if you just want to turn it into a vApp. Uh, and you get the same kind of choice of copy move. But again, I, I, I really advise don't make this your standard method for building vApps. This should be a corner case that is unique, uh, that solves a very specific problem. Now you do have a little bit of control outside of just providing applications, and that's in the form of lease timers. And I really like lease timers because they're not meant to be mean, so to speak. I mean, they kind of sound mean at first, like, wow, you're going to limit how long this vApp can run? That's not cool. You know, you might butt heads a little bit. But anyone that's worked in a virtualized environment can tell you one of the big kind of uh, gotchas is sprawl. And, and sprawl and zombies. So sprawl is the effect that it's easy to make virtual machines. Therefore, they kind of multiply. They sprawl all over the place. And you'll have lots of virtual machines. Uh, and that's the first case. That, that isn't really bad in of itself. But then you get what's called a zombie virtual machine. So all these virtual machines kind of sprawl all over the place. You have just lots and lots of them being consumed. A zombie is where it's kind of been abandoned. You know, maybe someone needed a vApp for a day or two, and then, eh, it's easy just to ignore it. I don't care. I'm not paying for it. You know, I'm, I'm not necessarily paying for it. I'm not necessarily maintaining it. I could have needed it specifically to test one thing. I need Maybe I needed to launch Internet Explorer 6 because there's a Windows XP VM that... All I need to do is check my web page in Internet Explorer 6. Great, works, doesn't work, I just ignore it. I don't, I don't log into it again, and I don't care about it. Least timers are ways to fight that kind of thing. Uh, and they provide value add to the environment because the user still has the ability to extend the lease. So let's walk through that really quick. If the runtime lease is hit on a virtual machine, the user can extend the runtime. They can say, you know what, I still need this. Let's go ahead and reset the clock. Now, as long as that user has that level of permission, they could just keep doing that indefinitely. And it's a good way to make sure a human is sitting there saying, yes, I still use this. Yes, I still need this. Don't get rid of it. The admin can also reset the lease timers or even change them. So it may be that the default is seven days or 15 days or whatever. And it comes to light that this virtual app 
needs to be set to indefinite or a year or something like that because that's the the duration of the project you know you know this is going to be used because the project is set to be three months or six months or whatever uh, and I've already covered that it helps fight sprawl and zombie v-apps because if no one's using it the runtime lease is going to expire because that person doesn't care they're not using it and ultimately the storage lease then begins and the storage lease is alright the runtime is now expired now how long do I wait on this expired VM before I you know, basically put it in the recycle bin and or delete it. So I also caution uh, that you typically want to avoid this for anything that's going to be put in production or near production. So if you're building a vApp that is supposed to run for production workloads, meaning they're either customer facing or they're just supposed to be up for infrastructure or vital systems or mission critical systems or really anything that the business relies upon, uh, you probably don't want to use a lease timer there. You want to set it to uh, never expire uh, so that no one person is responsible for making sure this vApp continues to be running without hitting its lease. Okay, so now let's go into the lab and we'll actually create vApps using a system account as well as consumers of the cloud, their accounts. So you can kind of see what the differences are and what powers and authorities are given to the different users. Okay, so we're back in the lab, and this time we're going to enter the developers cloud organization. So I've done, I've got that link here for the vCloud org developers. It's slash cloud slash org slash developers. And we'll log in as Mr. Joe Bob because he should have powers to create vApps based on the catalog. And yes, he is indeed a vApp author, so he should be able to see things in the catalogs and ultimately spin those into vApps. So if I go to add a app from add a V app from the catalog, click on that, and we'll look at the public. Oh, wait a minute! I can only see my organization's catalogs. So that's something that I think a lot of people hit, and I want to show you a very common issue there. In that, uh, by default, nobody, not even the org admin, can see any public catalogs. It, it's kind of annoying, actually. Uh, so that's why you may have made all this stuff in the public catalog. Everything looks great because you're the system admin and your users will say, yeah, I don't see anything in the catalog. Where are they at? Uh, that's why they, they need to be given that authority. So I'm going to cancel out of here and we won't make a vApp because I can't, uh, even though I am vApp author. And we'll log out really quick. We'll switch over to the system side and I'll show you how to give that power to them. So whoops, we'll click the favorites here, go back to the system which is just the slash cloud and I'll log in as a full administrator which is the full systems admin of the cloud and we'll go to the administration side and look at these roles so I was logging in as a vApp author which should be someone who can use the catalog and create vApps I mean it even says that verbatim right there so we'll click on author and we'll go to catalog and we'll see the permission for view publish catalog is actually not checked so they can view their catalogs, but they really can't see anybody else's that are published. So I have two choices at this point. I can either just check the box and give everyone that's using that role access, or I could make a new one. For this, we're just going to kind of do the straightforward method because I don't see any problem in my cloud environment at my, at my company to let people see the published catalogs. I'm okay with that. So I'm going to give the VApp authors the ability to do that, as well as my catalog authors. I'm going to let them see all these published catalogs. And there we go. So if you'll look, the only person that could ultimately see it is the org admin because he has everything. That's the, the ultimate role that encompasses every single permission. So, but you don't obviously don't want people building vApps as org admins. Uh, that would be limited to someone who has full power over the organization. So I've now given it to my vApp authors as well as my catalog authors so that they can see those public catalogs and use them. So let's go back We'll log back out here, and we'll go back to the developer side of things. I'll go to that developer's catalog, or I'm sorry, the developer's organization. We'll log back in as Joe Bob, and see what he can see now. So we'll add an app from the catalog, and drop down to public catalogs, and there we go. Now he can actually see and use the VMA uh, vApp template that we put in there. And you can see it two different ways. You can see all templates are just the gold masters. So that kind of maybe emphasizes a little more value out of the gold master nomenclature. Uh, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything on the VApp template. It's just a kind of a flag that you put so that people know which one to use. 
Now we only have one at this point called the VMA. The other one ha actually hasn't even finished uploading yet. But it really doesn't matter. We can still build off of this template. Uh, so in this case, we're doing kind of the first option I showed you. We're going to import a VApp template just as it is. And so I'll just select that, that VMA right there. Click Next. And because there's a EULA for this VApp, because it's actually an appliance that VMware provides, I have to accept that EULA before I can go forward. So it's telling you here, I'm accepting it for the vSphere Management Assistant. So that's okay, we'll click Next. And then it always does this uh, kind of numbering scheme here, VApp, name of the person, and some uh, in incrementing number. We, we don't want that. So this may be Joe Bob's uh, VMA. You know, that's kind of, a, that's not the best name in the world, but it'll work for Joe Bob. He's cool with that. So now we kind of walk through making some choices within the organization as they were laid out. Because remember, we have a provider virtual data center that feeds to our organization virtual data center, and there's some network pools that are tied with that. So as we're building vApps, we have a lot less choices because those choices were already made for us. The system admin and the org admin already kind of designed the organization to provide very specific services to the consumers of the cloud. So by here we see there's only one virtual data center. We have this developer virtual data center. But if you had more, you could choose them. And it tells you very clearly what kind of model we're using. This one's a reservation pool, as well as what hardware version. And the hardware version comes into play where if you're trying to use an old version of hardware, maybe version 7, uh, you would know that that organizational VDC wouldn't be compatible. You would need to choose the, a more appropriate one. But in this case, it's easy. There's only one. We'll give the virtual machine the name VMA. Uh, that's fine. Um, in fact, I'll call it VMA Joe Bob, just for fun, just to have his name on there somewhere. And the storage profile, there's only one here, but you could choose maybe a better, uh, you know, a faster set of disk or slower set of disk. And we'll click Next. Network mapping. Again, earlier in a different lesson, we made a network pool called Developer Applications. So that's the only one that's chosen for us. And you notice there's not a lot of visibility into what that ties to. We've we've really hidden exactly what VLAN that is, or port group, or, or what have you. It's all just kind of hidden underneath developer applications now. So it makes it easy for a consumer, as long as the name makes sense, you know, and this makes sense, oh, I'm a developer, I'm building a development application, I want to put it on a network called developer applications. You know, it's like Eureka. Uh, and then I can choose what kind of IP allocation I want to do. Do I want to use DHCP? Do I want to manually set the IP? I'm just going to let it use the pool of IPs that we gave to this network. I'm okay with that. And here's kind of an example of what's going to happen uh, on the network side. So that's great. We'll click Next. There's nothing we have to customize. If you had some kind of custom properties in there um, that the, the appliance or the virtual machine was requesting from you, you'd put it in here. But there are none for this one. And again, you get that kind of what's going to happen. That's fine. So we'll click Finish. And there we go. It'll go ahead and create the V app for you, Joe Bob's VMA. It's a very, very fun sounding V app. <laughs> and because there's only one VM within the V app, you only see the one kind of picture of a console right there. It's specifically the VM called VMA Joe Bob. And the least is uh, set to 16 days. So by default here, we had the least just set to that number. Because remember, uh, in, a, in a different lesson, we were worried about making sure that no one could accidentally go on vacation and lose their V app. So vacation time. In this company is two weeks, so 14 days, and I give them two extra days to come back from vacation and, and say, oh, no, I need that vApp. Don't delete it. Okay, so I've showed you how to build a vApp directly from a template where we didn't do any kind of additional VMs or really all that much customization. Now let's do option two, which is build new vApp. And you'll see it's actually right here. It says build new vApp. When you click this, it's a little more of an empowering workflow. It's the second option of the two where we can build, Joe Bob can build this brand new spanking vApp that has everything that he wants, the whole, the whole suit and tie. So we'll call it Joe Bob's Awesome vApp. Now, that's kind of a silly name, but let's say that this has SQL and maybe SharePoint server and a IIS server. Who knows? Uh, this would be kind of a, kind of a three-tier app, a database, application, and web server. And notice here, I can pick the leases. Ooh, that's interesting. Because I have the authority to make these kind of changes, because I can make a vApp, I can also kind of dictate how long it should run. Uh, and these are things that can be configured and controlled in the policies. But 
you know, we can we can set that based on our needs because we're building a new VM. Now notice I've pretty much got um, one or seven days here, and I, and I can change that to hours. You know, I could potentially have one hour or something really silly. You know, if I wanted to just test it really quick, use it, throw it away, I could set it really low. Um, but there are there are some limits that are imposed on there because we have maximum set up for this environment. So we'll set that just the defaults. I don't want to play with it for this one. Now, this is where it gets interesting because I can add virtual machines from the catalog. I'll switch it over here to public catalogs. So I could take the VMA here and I could add three of those. I mean, it really doesn't matter. I'm building a completely custom VApp. Uh, that would be kind of silly, so I'm going to remove those. But I could say, all right, I need the VMA, uh, which may be my database server, but I also need to make virtual machines. I need to make brand new virtual machines. So I can click new virtual machine and this kind of looks similar to the vSphere client where you're building a virtual machine from scratch. So I can see I need a new virtual machine for SharePoint because all I, all I saw the options for were VMA and that's not what I need. I need a SharePoint server. So I can see I need a SharePoint server. This will run SharePoint 2010 or whatever the most, most valid one for this a company might be. Version 9, it'll be running Windows. We're going to put it on Server 2008 R2. And you're just going to going along and saying, you know, what hardware version makes sense for you? What operating system makes sense within the family? What specific operating system? You could change it to, you know, there's a ton of them in here. Uh, even if you wanted to run Windows DOS, you, know, you, you can do it. You know, I don't know why you would, or Windows 3.1. Uh, but we'll choose 2008 R2. Uh, you can choose the number of CPUs. And if you go crazy there, like if I chose a 64 vCPU virtual machine, it's obviously way beyond the capabilities of the hardware. And it'll actually fail. Uh, it'll say that, you know, this is, will not run. Um, so you want to make sure that you expose the fact that you can only handle maybe four CPUs or something like that. Um, so we pick one CPU. Uh, expose the hardware-assisted CPU virtualization to guest OS. That's basically if I want to deploy a virtual machine that's running ESXi on it, for example, or Hyper-V, uh, I could actually do that, and if I exposed the virtualization, then that virtual machine can run other virtual machines. So you get kind of this uh, inception model. But normally you don't need that on, so I'm going to uncheck it. And 512 megs of RAM, that's a little low. Let's change it to maybe 2 gigs of RAM. And the hard disk size, 40 is fine. This is the SCSI controller. Uh, a little earlier I talked about Paravirtual. That would be a good example. If the person chose Paravirtual, they would then need the floppy image to install the pair of virtual drivers. So there's a great use case for having floppy media available. And then how many NICs? We'll just say, you know, just one is fine. And OK. And there we go. Now they have the VMA and their own custom SharePoint 2010 server. So they're building VMs within their vApp that you may not offer. We'll click Next there. Again, we have to accept the EULA because that VMA is included in our vApp. You're not always going to see that. And then for each virtual machine now, we can pick different storage tiers. And there's only one available uh, to the developers, but if you had, maybe SharePoint needed the better tier, you know, or maybe the database uh, that we're calling this VMA guy, maybe he needs better storage, faster storage. So those are the choices you can make. And then networking. So this is going to be interesting here. We've got different networks available to us. We've got the developer applications network, uses that. Or we could add a new network. So we actually make a new network and, and build it on the fly. Um, this isn't really uh, always used uh, because now we're building a vApp network and not every vApp needs a vApp network. But in this case, you could build one. And we'll, we'll go ahead and build one really quick. So uh, this one's going to use 192.168.2.1. It's not a network we're using anywhere else. So I'm fine with that. And we're just going to go very generic here. We'll use that network with that subnet. Uh, for primary DNS, I'll use the server that's inside of my area. Now, because I'm using a DNS outside of this subnet here, this 192.168.2.1, I need to make sure that it can get to that DNS server. It might not be able to necessarily, so uh, in this case, it would need to because I'm putting the information there. We'll put in the glacier.local DNS suffix. And the static IP pool that it gives by default is this 100 to 199, which gives it 100 IPs. I'm fine with that. You could also modify that and make it a little lower. You know, that might be overkill. You might say, you know what, I only want to do the 10 IPs. And to do that, all I did was just click on it, and then it kind of puts it up here, and you can change the number to 8. And instead of hitting Add, you hit Modify, and it changes that value. Well, next, network name 
this may be Joe Bob's V app network. You know, you may have something that simple. You know, it's only his. He doesn't need to really make it all that fancy sounding. And then finish. And then we got Joe Bob's V app network in here. And we can choose that for both of these guys. And they can only kind of talk to each other. Or we can add uh, uh, a developer applications network here. And then they wouldn't have to use that, that V app network. Whatever you want. Because you only have one NIC, you're really limited to the choice of you either put them on the V app network together or you'd put them on the developer network because if one's on the VApp network and the other one's on the organization developer network, they wouldn't be able to talk. So it would kind of defeat the purpose. So as it is by this design, we're kind of building a VApp isolated network because the only NIC they have is one NIC called NIC0 and they're both on a VApp network that's not going anywhere. So click Next. Uh, we're not going to worry about fencing or anything because they're already isolated in this little uh, VApp network. And we could say there's no connection at this point to the developer applications. If we decided to add that, then it could potentially get out of that VApp network by means of a vShield Edge appliance. And this is where it starts to get really fancy because it's really driven by what you need. Is this VApp, uh, does it need to talk out or does it need to be isolated because we're just testing something internally? These are questions you'll have to ask or the developer that's building it will kind of have to figure out as they go. Uh, potentially they'll have a design before they come in here and click 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 you know they're not just doing this on the fly but it's very application driven these aren't questions that can really be answered by infrastructure they're questions that need to be answered by the application and the developer so we're not going to make it too fancy for here we'll just say it doesn't connect anywhere and we'll click next and you get that typical this is what's going to happen I'm cool with that so I'll click finish and there we go Joe Bob's awesome V app is now being built it contains two virtual machines so we see the two black boxes, those are the console of the virtual machine. Has the same lease because we didn't change the number of days, we kept the default. And by default, once it gets done creating, it'll just be powered off. That's why this one says stopped, it's just, it's just not running, that's all that means. And once this gets done creating, we'll go in and play with it. But for now, let's switch back to the lesson. I'll cover the last section of this lesson, going over kind of the VApp diagrams and the networks. And then we'll come back to the lab and I'll show that piece to you. So VApp networking, as I kind of gave you a little, you know, kind of preview to, it can get really complex or it can be very simple. And again, the application really drives the discussion around how complex or simple it will be. There's three kind of sections that will help you when you're working with VApps because this can get really complex and really difficult. And it's all, I often find it really handy to have a whiteboard nearby so that you can diagram and draw out these applications before they ever even hit the vCloud environment. Because you really want to do a lot of the design before you start working in vCloud. That way you're not kind of making those decisions on the fly because that kind of builds uh, a, a kind of a spaghetti network of, oh, this one needed this and this other app needed that. So at any rate, when you're looking at a vApp, first you get is a, the first option available to you is the vApp diagram view. This is a great graphical view of the entire vApp, the relationship to the network. It really kind of helps draw a, a logical representation of what's going on. In addition to that, you get the virtual machines view, which allows you to look at all the virtual machines within the vApp and really get kind of information on their personality, their identity. You know, what OS are they running? What IP do they have? What data store are they running? This is a very common view that an org admin or maybe a sysadmin might need just to see what's going on, you know, kind of get the, the skinny on the virtual machines that are running in there. And you can use it for tweaking. You may say, oh man, that's the wrong storage profile. It should actually be on tier zero, not tier one. You can make those changes. And then the networking view. This is really how we make a relationship between uh, how the vApp is perceived on the network. And we can control the vShield, which is now vCloud Network and Security Services to the networks. So we're no longer really concerned in this view about the virtual machines, we're worried about the vApp and how it's using and consuming those different networks. So let's go back into the lab a, a final time for this lesson and I will show you these different views and kind of ways that you can utilize them. Okay so here we are back in the lab and I've got the view to both the different vApps in front of you. Now let's click on this open link. You can see it right here it says open to see the different views I was talking about for the vApp. Now there's another way to get there. If you're just in my cloud, you can go to vApps. And if you click on any one of these vApps, or double click rather, it'll open it up that way. And it'll show up in your recent items. 
or if you just click on the name, like it says, this one says uh, Joe Bob's Awesome V App. You click on that. There's there's probably six different ways to get there. Choose whichever one makes sense to you. And then here's those three views I was talking about. Now the first one is the V App diagram, and this is how you get a really great look at how this thing is networked. You can see here at the bottom we've got Joe Bob's V App network is then tied to the NIC on both of these. Uh, here's the NIC zero. And you can see the IP 192.168.2.101 and this one is 2.100 so it chose two different IPs out of my pool. They're currently powered off so you don't see anything on the screen but this gives you the relationship of the network. You notice it doesn't go anywhere else. They're tied to this private VAP network or rather isolated VAP network and that's all they can do is talk to one another. Now you'll notice there's a couple different icons as well. You can do right here, this is add a virtual machine, so we can even change the vApp after it's been deployed. That's pretty cool. You could build a new vApp or, or rather build a new virtual machine and put it on here or grab something out of your catalog. It looks very similar to before except we're not building an entire new vApp. We're just adding a VM to the vApp. I'll cancel that. Uh, and also you can add networks. Now because these are really simple virtual machines with one NIC, there's really not much you can do on the network side. You would have to actually edit one of these virtual machines and give it an additional NIC that could tie to maybe a different organization network or directly to the external network, something like that. They can only go to one network. Although we could edit the VApp network and plumb it into an org network or an external network. So there's, there's changes we can make to the networking, the point I'm trying to drive is each NIC can only go to one network. And in this case, they're both tied to this VApp network. You can also power on, pause, or stop, or restart the virtual machine. So I could select one of these and do options on that. I could power it on. Um, and if I do that, really nothing's going to happen because it's just a blank virtual machine. There's no operating system or anything on there. But I'll, I'll power it on just so you can see kind of the process. It'll just show that it's busy and then you'll actually you can see the console if I click on it of what's going on. Um, so it's not powered on currently, it's in the process of powering on. Um, and then there's the little widget here that gives you very similar to what you're used to seeing with a virtual machine. You can put in the CD, the floppy, update the tools. Now that it's actually powered on, the, the options have changed a little bit. So let's click on that. I'm actually missing the plugin in my IE here, so we have to install it. Um, so we'll save the, the plugin real quick. And that's something you would see if you didn't have the plugin. We'll click close and we'll allow the remote plugin. So this is a good uh, good example of first time use. So let's go back into the V app, and I'll open the the console there. And there you go. You can see the console of this new virtual machine, which should basically just be angry about the fact that it has nothing to boot off of. You know, it's just saying here there's no operating system. So th this this VM doesn't really do anything. I can close that console and you get the same kind of power, pause, stop, etc. options. It's very similar to using the web client for vSphere. I'll close that and we can power on the VMA as well. Power that on. It'll go through the similar process. Now while that's powering on, let's go to virtual machines really quick. And you can see this is a more virtual machine focused view. I can see what each one is doing, uh, operating system it's using, uh, the different NICs that are in use, and what network they're tied to, IP, any external IPs that might be shown, and the tier of storage that it's on. So, um, so this view is just really great for working in the nitty gritty of the virtual machine. And it gives you the same kind of view that we saw before with the, you can add a new virtual machine, you can power, pause, stop, reboot, etc. Uh, but it gives you a lot more information on the virtual machines itself. And then the final view, networking, Again, this one's more about the networks that the vApp is consuming. We're not really looking at the virtual machine anymore. We're looking at the fact that if I drag this out, we've got Joe Bob's vApp network, what gateway it's going to, the, the subnet, all that kind of information, it, uh, if it were fenced or not, if we're retaining MAC and IP addresses. In this case, we're not fencing anything, so there's, there's no retaining to, to be, uh, there's nothing to be retained. <laughs> But this is where you control basically what the networks were doing. So if we had a new network on here, you know, maybe we've got an org network that's being used, uh, like the developer applications network, we can add that to this particular vApp and we can apply that. And there it is. Now we're not necessarily using it, but we can dictate information about this network. We could you know, notice uh, now the fence vApp is now a choice because we have an org network that we can fence from. 
We can offer services such as NATing, network address translation, or firewall. And within this fencing, we can retain those IP and MAC addresses that are being fenced. So there's all sorts of new options that are available depending on what networks are available. Uh, but you control that here. So let's go back. I'm not. I'm actually going to revert that change. I don't want to. I don't want to make any uh, fence networks or anything like that. But if I go back to the diagram now, we've got. I can click on VMA. And I can show you that console. And drag that out a little bit. And there we go. We can see this is an actual virtual machine that does stuff. The underlying storage and hypervisors that I'm using, the, the hosts, are pretty slow, so this thing is running slow. That's not a function of vCloud. That's just a function of my lab equipment that I'm using. But I want to show you that you you know we actually can have real running virtual machines in here. Uh, so I'll close that. And then we'll look at the other vApp really quick. So I'll click vApps, and then we'll click this other stop one, the Joe Bob's VMA. JoeBob's VMA looks a little different because it's actually tying to a different network. It's de tying directly to that developer applications. So there is no vApp network. It just goes straight down to developer applications. So it looks a little different. And if I go to networking, you'll see uh, all we have is developer, app developer applications. There's no vApp network um, that it's using. And you have the same kind of options. You want to fence it. You want to offer services for routing, retain the IP MAC address again. Uh, all sorts of interesting uh, network information can be gleaned from this section if you want to make changes. And the other thing I'll point out is if you go to virtual machines here, you just get a list of all the virtual machines as well as what vApp they're in. So if you really wanted to just take a take a look at, okay, how many SQL boxes am I running? How many web boxes am I running? You can go straight into virtual machines. It will tell you all that information. You can get straight to the console. Another good use case is you may have so many vApps that you're wondering, man, where is this one virtual machine at? I, I thought I had one called SharePoint somewhere, and none of the none of the vApps have the word SharePoint in it, so where is that app? So you can click that. Oh, there's my SharePoint vM. Gotcha. It's inside of Joe Bob's awesome vApp. So it's just a way you can kind of, you know, dig into the virtual machines and, without having to worry about what vApp they belong to. So that covers vApps pretty in-depth as far as how do you build templates, how do you get media into your catalog, who can see the catalog, and ultimately building vApps. I hope you enjoyed this lesson, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.